that's how easy it is to charge up an electric car. Well here we are at the back of the house where charging normally takes place and as you can see the Rolex charger is situated between the gas meter on the left and the electricity meter on the right. This was installed under the OLEV grant and I provided the backboard because as you'll shortly see the house is manufactured out of very attractive Yorkshire stone but unfortunately it is extremely uneven and would have proven impossible just to bolt the charger to the wall so using a bit of gash polypropylene that I had from my work I constructed this very substantial backboard and beveled it off and then used some spacers and bolted the whole thing through into the mortar uh, between the stonework as I was anxious obviously not to damage the whole thing. Now we casually refer to these things as chargers but actually as you know they're not because all that we actually have in the top we have a residual current detector followed up by an 11 kilowatt telemac contactor the Manica's Type 2 cable and uh, connector and a little electronic relay that actually talks to the car. There's just really a few components there, but there's no actual charger as we know that resides in the car itself. Now as we shortly see, this is the business end of it, but there are further connections inside the garage where we're able to measure the kilowatts and everything else and talk to base. Well here we are inside the garage and this is the main consumer unit for the house and what we got is a 32 amp breaker controlling the whole thing and moving up we have a kilowatt meter and a little mobile phone transmitter that tells base exactly how much we're using. This is all part of the OLEV grant. Finally we got the output wire going through the wall to a little Rolex charger and as I say when we're away from the house we just knock off the contact to stop any spurious trips. Well here we are inside the car and I've got the trip display up and if you'll cast your eyes over trip B which I haven't reset since I got the car you'll see we've done about 61,000 miles consumed 17 megawatt hours of electricity at an average rate of 278 watt hours per mile. Now if we had been buying all of that 17 meg of electricity at home at 12 pence a kilowatt it would have cost approximately 3.3 pence a mile which isn't bad really. Now in reality I think we've done about uh, 4 megawatt hours of electricity here and another 1.5 to 2 megawatt hours at our other house in West Norfolk which means we've had about 11 to 12 megawatt hours of electricity from DC fast chargers, superchargers, chatamos, you know, ecotricity, charge your car and all the rest. So we've had our money's worth out of those. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you might be asking yourselves well I wonder if this car is supercharger limited and the answer is it is. When I originally got the car in February 16, it would, under the right circumstances, pull about 115 kilowatt hours of electricity, albeit for a short time. But after February of this year, the maximum it pulls and still continues to pull is 94 kilowatt hours of electricity. Now this probably arises because my battery may have slightly higher internal resistance because of this uh, continued fast charging, such that if we charge that higher 115 kilowatt hours, Perhaps we would cause a bit of uh, a bit of heat because that internal resistance, which as we all know, is detrimental to the battery life. So I suspect that's what happened. Now, in actual reality, I only ever saw 115 kilowatt hours for about five minutes. So dropping off to 94 is no big deal. It uh, means you might be at the charger a little more, you know, the odd minute or two longer. But in reality, when I'm supercharging, once it drops below about uh, a rate of 40 kilowatt hours, I generally knock it off, which is about two thirds, maybe 200 miles uh, on the clock because uh, the charging rate becomes slower and slower. And at the lead supercharger, where there's only two, it's not really fair to hog it uh, from there on. Now one of the things I didn't like when I first got the car it was that there was nowhere to store any coins. Now at a BMW, a Mercedes or an Audi they give you a few little nooks and crannies where you can secrete your coins. So what I did, I just got a little sample bottle, cut it down and filed the edges so that uh, there was nothing sharp and hey presto you've got a nice coin container well concealed there. And the other thing was this cavernous space between the seats which would be ideal for ladies with big handbags but for me it annoyed me because all the bits and bobs that you carry shoot backwards when you accelerate and everything else. So using a bit of beige polypropylene I uh, welded up this little device to compartmentalize the whole thing and put some rubber matting there so you can balance your phone and your partner's phone there um, and just fitted it and it, uh, it actually has worked out uh, pretty convenient for us. 
And now when it comes to cleaning this uh, this marvellous screen, what I've done is to just get some standard wipes actually that you can buy in any common supermarket and put them in one of these uh, clip containers because what I did find is that when you normally buy it you find that uh, uh, they go dry and everything else so this manages to keep the uh, to keep the whole job dry which I found to be quite satisfactory without uh, having too many. Now looking at the internal trim and I think we've said this before that perhaps the fit of uh, all the bits and bobs and everything else isn't quite up to the fine standards one expects from BMW and Mercedes-Benz and I've had a few squeaks and rattles but actually what I've done I've traced these quite often to uh, little bits of vibration in the trim items so what I've done is got a few bits of hard rubber and I've just sort of forced them in to put a bit of tension into the job so that uh, most of the rattles have gone away now there's the odd squeak or whatever but actually I can live with that and I think this will improve as Tesla's gets uh, gets a bit better about its manufacturing Now just to show you the lack of wear on the brakes of this car after 60,000 miles, let's have a look at the front discs and I'll show you that there's no lip at all and they're not even particularly shiny. There we are, this is the front uh, near side wheel and if you can see the disc, it's there and there's absolutely no lip at all and it's not particularly shiny, I have to say. So that just shows you how very little we've actually used the brakes. And on the rear of the car, even more pronounced there so that should last virtually forever bad news if you're in the uh, brake replacement business that's all I can say I managed to avoid curbing the wheels too much I detected a bit of damage the other day here there's a little a few little chunks out of it there but uh, I've been reasonably lucky you can see the um, trim alignment here is not particularly good and the gaps on the bonnet that's the uh, off side and that's the near side um, not brilliant but not really a game changer either the paint works still pretty good kept it clean the other day although I think after uh, you know a year and three quarters I need to get the clay bar out and just get rid of a few of the little lumps and bumps that you can feel inevitably on the on the paintwork is also when you're cleaning and polishing this thing it's a big motor car with an awful lot of area to it so you really have to want to wash this thing because it's going to take you a time and uh, but it's it's fun I have to say but I must confess most of the time we take it to one of these uh, drive-through car washes that uh, have seemed to have sprung up around the country Well here we are in Aviemore at the McDonald's hotel chain and as you can see there are 12 superchargers beautifully aligned of which only six were working when we were here a couple of months ago. But if you just look at their red van there's something interesting by the fence. And here we are an original Tesla Roadster charger. This is only the second one I've seen. But it does illustrate the relationship that Tesla must have with the McDonald chain and hence why they've selected them to put the superchargers in at the back here which is entirely appropriate. Now we're at T-Base Services M6 southbound and there's eight new superchargers but interestingly on the northbound carriageway, which I haven't photographed, round the back, hidden away, there is yet again a Tesla Roadster charger. So once more, this shows an old relationship between Tesla and the Farmers Cooperative, who actually own T-Base Services. And finally, here we are at Scotch Corner, just up the A1, where there are some superchargers not quite as far advanced as the ones we've just seen. These superchargers are not actually at the services at Scotch Corner, but at the large Holiday Inn Hotel opposite. But there are some services there, like coffee and everything else, so it won't be a problem. They should be up and running quite soon.